Isn't it wonderful to be part of the family of God? Amen, indeed. Especially when Granny Ford's friendship bread is thrown into the mix. That is the truth. Uh, there was a group of young ladies that met uh, just a little while ago and learned how to make uh, Miss Granny Ford's friendship bread. Uh, and I just want to say I've been here um, almost, almost a year now. Uh, and just the short time I've been here and talking to all of our visitors uh, that we've had, uh, the majority of them say, wow, this is the most friendly congregation I think I've been a part of. And, and that's uh, due mainly to the fact, I, th fact, I think, of, uh, of, of Miss Granny Ford uh, making friendship bread and being very proactive uh, about, about giving that out. So young ladies, uh, you are baking bread not just to learn how to bake bread, but you're baking bread for the glory of God. Uh, so, so always remember that. And thank you so much for what you do. Uh, several hundred years ago, there was a uh, very famous painter named Rembrandt. Uh, he, paint, he painted a, a very well-known, very famous painting uh, that depicts the crucifixion scene. You can, send, uh, you can Google it if, if, you, um, if you'd like. But in, in, in that picture, in that painting, uh, you can see all the soldiers um, around the cross and Jesus on the cross. And you can even see Rembrandt himself within the painting. Rembrandt painted himself within the crucifixion scene. Um, and it's be he did that. He painted himself at the foot of the cross amidst the Roman soldiers and everybody around uh, in, in, in that circumstance. Uh, he painted himself in that scene because he believed that he was there. Another illustration, several years ago when Mel Gibson made The Passion of the Christ, I think it was 2003, uh, it was a very big deal at the time when the movie was made uh, that Mel Gibson himself, uh, when, they did, when they had the crucifixion scene uh, there and the soldiers are nailing uh, the nail into Jesus' palm, uh, they, made it, they made a big deal about how it was Mel Gibson's hand himself that was in that picture. Um, and that wasn't just on accident. That was very symbolic. His hand uh, was, um, he, he did that. He, he was there in the scene. He placed his hand in the movie because he believed that his hand was the one that nailed Jesus to the cross. And as we've seen, as we've sung before, and how deep the Father's love goes, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, this is what we sing, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is is finished. All of us, in some form or fashion, when we look at our sin and when we're honest with ourselves, can see ourselves at the cross, at the crucifixion scene. All of us, in some form or fashion, can see ourselves at the cross, like Rembrandt, like Mel Gibson, and like we seeing, seeing in how deep the Father's love. The Bible teaches that when we see ourselves at the cross and are confronted by our sin, there will be different kinds of responses. People will respond differently when they behold their sin, when they, when they realize that it was them that crucified the Lord Jesus. As we read in the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, some people, upon hearing the word, misunderstand it. Some people rather receive it, but they fall away due to pleasures, or some fall away due to persecutions when times get hard, when, time, when the going gets rough. Some people leave the faith and abandon uh, the, the faith. And some, as the parable goes, allow the Word of God to take root in their heart and become productive members of the kingdom. So with that being said, and with that in mind, for just a moment, I want us to focus, on, uh, focus our minds upon some of those who were around Jesus at the time of his crucifixion. I want us to notice how they responded to the crucified Lord. And I want us to examine ourselves, to look inwardly, to look inside of ourselves and see if we can see 
ourself in one of these people that we're going to talk about that were there at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The first person that I want to look at very briefly tonight is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Turn with me if, in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 49. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 49. I love studying Mary. I love reading passages about Mary, the mother of Jesus, because I believe that she paints this beautiful picture of what a humble servant of Jesus Christ truly looks like. And you can see within her prayer slash song in Luke chapter 1, verses, starting in verse 46, it goes on for several verses, but we're going to read just through 49. It says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things. For me, and holy is his name. Mary says, my soul magnifies. Her soul magnifies the Lord. When you magnify something, when you magnify it, you make it look like it really is. Just remember when you were in biology class or were you, when you were in science class, when you look through a magnifying glass or, or a microscope at, at a cell, uh, when, we, when we did that, when we looked at a plant cell or an animal cell, and when we looked at it when it was magnified, we were looking at reality. We were looking at what that cell actually looks like close up. We were beholding reality. That's what uh, magnifying does. Mary's purpose, this is, this is what she says in life, and this is just so beautiful. She paints a beautiful picture of what a true disciple of Jesus Christ is and looks like. Mary's purpose in life was to magnify God, was to make God look like He really is. That's our life's purpose, isn't it? to magnify God, to show the world what God is really like. That's our job. That's our mission. And that, that's what Mary's life was dedicated to as well. In Luke chapter 2, verse 19, it says, But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. I've often heard from... Um, my mom, that her memories, she talks often about memories of raising uh, my brother and sister and I, uh, but she talks about memories of raising us kids um, as uh, she refers to them as little pieces of treasure uh, that she stores up within her heart. I think that just goes to show that the love that a mother shows to their children is one of the greatest kinds of love uh, that exists. And Mary, when we think about her love for the Savior, for the Son of God that was her own, she loved Jesus that way. The way, just the way that a mother loves her son or her daughter, that's the way she related to Jesus. That's, that's the, the kind of affection that Mary showed to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that of a mother and her child. And then lastly, on Mary in John chapter 19, verse 25, this is Mary in one of the probably the hardest moments in her entire life. John chapter 19, verse 25 says, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of, wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Even while after all of his followers abandoned him, the people that are supposed to be close to Jesus with him till the end, they abandoned them. They all fall away. But his mother, Mary, was with Jesus until the bitter end. She was going nowhere because that's the kind of person she was. We see in Mary the kind of love and loyalty that, that Jesus desires from all of us. Mary, her desire was to glorify God, to magnify Him in everything that she did. She viewed Jesus not as just um, uh, as, as first or second or third within her life, but Jesus was her complete 
treasure. She stored up everything within her heart. And she, and she was with him when the, when the going got rough and when times were hard. She was with him till the end. That's the kind of uh, way that Jesus desires us to relate with him. Matthew chapter 24 verse 13 says, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. As much as your mother loves you, and we see this through Mary, as much as your mom loves you, love Jesus like that because he has first shown that kind of love for you. Remain with him till the end. That's what Mary did, uh, and that's what God wants from us. Now I want to look at a second person that was uh, around uh, the... um, the circumstances of, of Jesus' uh, surrounding the events of the crucifixion, and that's the Apostle Peter. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 16, if you will. Matthew chapter 15, verses 16, rather, verses 15 through 16. We, as we read the New Testament, we see that Peter, the Apostle Peter, was somebody that was uh, very zealous. He was on fire uh, for Jesus. He wanted uh, nothing more than for Jesus to establish his earthly kingdom and defeat the Romans and establish this messianic kingdom that would, that, that would never end. And he wanted to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. He was zealous. Um, he was passionate about the cause of Jesus. Uh, and, and we see in Matthew 16, 15 an instance of this. And uh, and, and when Jesus says, but he said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, he says, the son of the living God. Peter was passionate and he was zealous about his faith. But he had some character flaws at the same time we all know of. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 58 it says, after Jesus, after Peter had denied Jesus, it says, and Peter was following him. That's what Peter did. That's what he dedicated his life to. He dedicated his life to following Jesus and, and being, becoming the person that Jesus wanted him to be. It says, and he was following, following him at a distance. He was following Jesus at, at a distance. As far as the courtyard of the high priest and going inside, he sat down with the guards to see the end. This is the man that said a few verses prior to this, a few verses earlier, if they all fall away, if every single one of your followers, if they reject you and, and, and go their own way and view you as, and, and don't think that you're the Messiah... I will never fall away. It doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter if they, if, if they threaten my life. It doesn't matter what they threaten me with. I will never fall away, he says. But then in the very next scene, we see Peter following Jesus at a distance. I think there are many people who follow the pattern of Peter within their daily life. They come to Christ... They may be passionate at first. They may be zealous. And then as time goes on and as they fail to build their faith, to come closer to Jesus Christ, they end up following Jesus only at a distance. And we see this problem in the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. When Jesus confronts them, Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, this is what they say, this is what they claim. I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. One of the major problems with the church at Laodicea was that they found little value. They found little need or little value in advancing their faith and growing closer to the heart of Jesus. They said, I have everything that I need. I'm I'm wealthy. I have clothes. I have food. I have shelter. What need do I have of Jesus? They kept their distance from Jesus and didn't view him as the source that could quench 
their greatest need. When I was in college, I interviewed several preachers, and I asked them for a project from one of my classes, and I asked um, what, uh, what they thought the greatest problem in the church uh, was, and the majority of them, without hesitation, said apathy, a lack of interest, a lack of dedication, a, a, a desire for other things other than Jesus, finding little value in a relationship with Christ and advancing that, that relationship, but being content with the status quo, being content with the state that I am in right now and showing no interest in advancing in faith. That's what they said, one of the major problems that we're facing even in the church. The path to apathy, a loss of interest, uh, it doesn't happen, the Bible teaches, overnight. It's, it's a slow process. It's a slow fade. A uh, popular Christian band named Casting Crowns several years ago came out with a song named, called Slow Fade. I want to read the, read the lyrics because I think they're very true. It says, it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray and thoughts invade, choices are made, and a price will be paid when you give yourself away. People, it says, never crumble in a day. It is a slow fade. Brothers and sisters, we need to be aware that Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion. He wants us to be content with where we are at in our faith. He wants us to be content with the status quo, be content in not advancing our faith in the cause of Jesus Christ. He wants us to follow Jesus. Follow Him, yes, but at a distance. Where are you in your walk with Christ and your relationship with Him? A third person that I'd like to look at briefly tonight is Judas. Judas. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5, it says, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and he hanged himself. His heinous actions against the Lord led him to feel this deep sensation of regret. When we look at Judas and, and his life, who he followed in his life, Judas had everything at his fingertips. He had every advantage. He followed God in the flesh around for several years. He followed God Himself, yet He threw it all away. He threw everything away, seeking pleasure, seeking other pleasures, and, and He regretted it. That's the emotion that He experienced in this passage, was deep, immense regret. The feeling of regret is, for me personally, it's one of the most gut-wrenching feelings that a person uh, could experience. Maybe not the most, but one of the most. And I, I just, I cringe when I look back on uh, past sins, things I know I could have done better, things that I regret. I, I, I cringe, and it, cringe and it almost grieved um, when I think of past things that I know I should have done that I failed to do. I believe that there are so many people so many people, even in the church, that are setting themselves up for deep regret within the future. They're living the kind of life that, that will look back on, that they'll look back on when they're old and, and be overwhelmed with feelings of remorse. I hope that doesn't fit you. I hope that doesn't fit your, uh, your circumstance. Examine yourself. Ask yourself, am I living a life right now that in 30, 40 years when I, when I become old and gray and I look back on, am I going to feel, am I going to have that sensation of regret? Is that going to be me? Am I going to be a Judas? 
This is the attitude of the Apostle Paul when he is old and when he looks back on his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is what, me personally, this is what I want to say when I am old. I want to say I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the The faith. This is the note I believe that we all desire to end our lives on, but it takes work now. It takes a commitment, it takes a full surrender to the will of God and a dedication to cultivate things I need to do to get me there. I want to say I fought the good fight and I have finished the race. Are you leading a life right now that's going to lead to regret? Or right now are you leading a life that when you become old and gray, you can look back on and I say and say, I don't regret anything. I loved my Savior to the end. Next, I want to look at Simon of Cyrene. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. It says, as Jesus is being led away, being led away to be crucified, it says, And as they went out, they found a man, a Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled, focus on that word, compelled. They compelled this man to carry his cross. The Greek word in this passage rendered compel in English. In Greek, it means to force someone to carry out a task. So, Simon wasn't uh, willingly helping Jesus carry his cross. This is something that he was forced to do. He said, no, 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 I don't want any, I don't want any part of this. I don't want to help this man whatsoever. The Roman soldiers forced Simon, rather, to pick up Jesus' cross and carry it. There's so many people today that follow this pattern, that follow the pattern of Simon. I was a youth minister for several years, and I saw many of our teens coming to church just because their parents came, just because their parents made them, just because they were forced to, without a desire to grow, without a desire to be who Jesus once wanted them to be. But not just teenagers. We see, um, uh, I've, I've seen within my experience, husbands or wives coming to church just wanting to please their spouse, just wanting to please somebody without having any desire, without having um, any, any, any passion of growing themselves. We see this even in our lives today. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I believe that too many times we see people believing that they can become kind of this honorary Christian by riding the coattail of another person's faith. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that you must go through that gate alone. You can't go through that narrow gate. You can't follow that narrow path riding the coattail of another person's faith. Faith. You have to have your own faith. You have to cultivate a desire and a passion to grow yourself within Jesus Christ. I challenge all of us tonight to grow in our vision of the gospel. See the gospel, the good news of Jesus, as the most beautiful, as the most valuable possession that there exists in the world today, that there ever is, and develop your own faith based upon that cultivation of a desire of of the beauty of the gospel within within you uh, and, and follow Jesus till the end. Lastly, the uh, last person that I want to look at is the criminal on the cross. In Luke chapter 23, verses 40 and 41, the faithful criminal that is, it says in verse 40, But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of, con- sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, this Jesus, 
has done nothing wrong. The most unlikely person, the most unlikely person makes the most shocking admission. I believe that this is one of, this is possibly one of the hardest things for people to admit in their life that they are wrong and that they have failed to become righteous on their own. But that is what this person does. He says, there's nothing good in me. There is nothing, there, 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 there is, is no quality. There is nothing uh, inherently within me that God will look upon and, 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 and have favor upon me. I have sinned, he says. I have, I, I, I have sinned and I am separated from God. And the only person, the only person that is in the right is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's hard. That's difficult to admit that I am a sinner in need of salvation. But that's what this man does. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul makes that same admission. He says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom, he says, I am the, not a sinner, not just one of many, but he says, I am the sinner of whom I am the foremost. Christ's demand is for us to look inwardly. It's for us to look within our own heart and see the ugliness that sin has created within us. He desires us to say, I am the sinner, because that is the only path to true restoration, to true healing. When I look at myself and I say, I am a the sinner in need of the Savior. And the Savior promises that when I recognize my sin and His glory and His beauty and His sinless, sinlessness and His ability to take me and wash me clean and make me something that was once ugly and wretched and pitiable into something that is beautiful and precious and white as snow, when I go down that path and make that admission, that is when I begin to heal. That's what Jesus wants from us. That's what He wants. That's what He desires. So tonight, I want this, this sermon, the purpose of it is for all of us to examine ourselves. That's a very biblical principle, to look within our heart and see where we are within our faith. Are we shrinking? Are we backsliding? Are we going farther away from Jesus? Or are we advancing in our faith? How do you see yourself in the light of the cross of Jesus Christ? Are you with, like Mary? Are you with Jesus till the end? Are you like Peter? Are you following Jesus but only following Him at a distance? Are you like Judas and you're living a life that's leading to regret? Uh, are you following Jesus with, with no real affections for Him, like, like Simon of Cyrene only being forced to, um, or, uh, or, 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 or following Jesus just to please somebody else? Do you know the right thing to do, but too afraid to carry it out? Or do you recognize yourself as the sinner, like the criminal on the cross, and surrender all to Jesus? Jesus' desired response from us is to say, I am the sinner, and to live until the end with Him. That is the path to healing. That is the path to true joy, to true and lasting joy. And that's something that Jesus desires, uh, not just for His church, but the entire world. And that's the message that we preach and we teach. If you have any need tonight, if you wish uh, to prayers from the church, if you're hurting in some way and you wish for us to bear your burden in prayer, um, or if you know that you have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, you've heard the gospel, the good news that, that, that has the power um, to transform a once dead person into a living,
living uh, soul that has a relationship with God, if you recognize tonight that you are in a sinner, please, that you are a sinner, please come forward and confess faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, beginning a relationship with Him, as F.H. talked about this morning. If you have any need tonight, please come forward as we stand.